Now for our story. The train bearing Lisa Fenner and Paul Cromwell sped through the smooth snowfields of the Middle West. In a few hours, they would be in Chicago. Lisa was the young woman with whom Kit Mead had shared a house at Malibu Beach during her stay in California. The woman who, because of a mistaken sense of guilt for the accident which had caused Kit the loss of her own child, a sense of guilt which Kit had deliberately fostered, had finally brought herself to overcome her deep maternal feelings and to relinquish her own baby son to Kit. Kit had told Lisa that if she could take the child, she would return to Wakefield, restore her marriage to Bill Mead, completely withdraw from Paul Cromwell's life. And Lisa loved Paul Cromwell. Sitting in the club car, reviewing the events of the last month. Max? Yes, sir. Here's the paper, sir. Good. Let's have a look at it. Um, Mr. Cromwell. Yes, Max? I took the liberty of glancing at the news as I came through the train. Oh, naturally. Um, I saw an item, it wasn't the ethical section, which uh, might be of interest to you. Oh, really, Max? Oh, not Susanna Blythe. Good Lord, don't tell me she's in Chicago. <laughs> oh, no, sir. I think, in a way, this may strike you as good news. The item to which I referred is here, sir. Let's see. Let's see. The Fred Astaire of the Nitories clicks solidly in his recent opening at the Cobra Room. Lance Fenner, whose intricate patterns and subtle timing had the... Lance. So Lisa's husband will be. Huh. Well, I foresee an eventful stay in Chicago. You're not worried, are you, Mr. Cromwell? Worried? Far from it. I only wish... I know, but that's impossible. Impossible, Mr. Cromwell? Isn't it said that nothing is impossible? <laughs> well, perhaps. But I'm afraid my wish was a bit more than I could ever expect. What did you have in mind, sir? One never knows, sir. I was thinking that I would like to see Lisa and Lance fall into each other's arms with loud cries of joy and have a nice lover's reunion. It does seem unlikely. But strange things happen in a woman's heart. Well, strange is hardly the word, Max. You might even say weird. And I confess, I've been at my wit's end lately. Mrs. Fenner is a very emotional young woman. Emotional? Lisa makes Scarlett O'Hara seem cold and unfeeling by comparison. You never know what she's going to do or say next. Well, Mr. Cromwell, if you'll forgive me, it was my opinion from the beginning that you were being uh, rather unwise. Oh, I know, I know, Max. I should have listened to you. But you see, the whole situation was so complicated. Lisa suddenly arriving in Malibu from San Francisco, all in a dither about Lance's walking out on her, and, and then Kit's blowing him from Wakefield. I couldn't let Lisa down. She was in a bad spot. And now, Mr. Cromwell, you're in one yourself, it seems to me. Yes, I suppose I am. It is at the moment. But once we get everything straightened out about the baby, we get that settled legally, well, then Kit and I can begin to live our own lives. And Mrs. Fenner? Ah, uh, something may happen. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, Max. But I'm afraid, Mr. Cromwell, that the problem cannot be dismissed so lightly. Mrs. Fenner is, as you say, somewhat... Unpredictable. If it were Mrs. Mead now, the whole question would have a different aspect. Kit. Yes, Max, if it were a kit we had to contend with now, things would be very different. In fact, there'd be no problem. Mrs. Mead is so sophisticated, so sure of herself. Yes. Yes, indeed she is. Um, have you heard from Mrs. Mead lately? No, no, I had just a couple of very brief notes. Kit's not much of a correspondent. Never has been. But I imagine if there were any startling developments in Wakefield, she would have written. I can depend on her. I hope so. What's the matter, Max? Out with it. Um, it's just, Mr. Cromwell, that I've been a bit worried. Worried, Max? Yes. Disturbed, you might say. I, I'd like to take the liberty of suggesting that you exercise great care in your dealings with Mrs. Fenner. Don't expect too much. Or rather, expect the worst. The worst? Uh, I believe you should keep a careful eye on her. Well, how can I keep a careful eye on her? 
Do you expect she's going to disappear on a very respectable train? I'm not concerned about what happens on the train, Mr. Cromwell. But after we get to Chicago... Yes, Max. Then what? Chicago is only a short distance from Wakefield. If Mrs. Fenner were to take it into her head to go down to Wakefield, it might be very awkward. That's why I feel you're on dangerous ground. Dangerous ground? Lisa. Who's on dangerous ground? Never mind, Lisa. I'm going to let you die of curiosity as a punishment for coming into a gentleman's drawing room without knocking. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. You're perfectly right. Forgive me. I, I didn't think. I suppose it's a carryover for my theater days. When Lance and I used to travel from town to town with our act. Nobody pays much attention to things like that on sleeper jumps, as we call them. And, uh, speaking of Lance, you haven't heard from him lately, I suppose. Well, why, no. What makes you ask that? Oh, just that I, uh... What, Paul? Oh, nothing, Lisa, nothing. Are you all packed, Mrs. Fenner? Well, y yes, I am, Max. Good. Then I think I'll go and see to the luggage. We're due to arrive in Chicago in about an hour. Will you excuse me, sir? All right, Max. Paul. Oh. Yes, Lisa? What were you and Max talking about when I came in? Talking about? Well, let me see. Politics, I believe. Why? I... I just had an idea you were talking about me. You both look so self-conscious. Oh, nonsense, Lisa. Honestly, you're so super sensitive. So engrossed in yourself. You imagine the silliest things. And even assuming that we had been talking about you, there'd be no harm in it. Max is fond of you, and he's a bit worried about you. And so am I. But... but why, Paul? Well, good heaven, Lisa. Look at yourself in the mirror this minute. You're obviously about to burst into tears. Floods of them. And it's practically a daily occurrence. Now, why wouldn't I be worried? I'm sorry, Paul. Lisa, it's doing no harm to me. It's doing you the harm. But I do wish you'd try to get a hold of yourself. It's very, very trying. I know, Paul. I tell myself I... I must pull myself together, not make scenes. I know how men hate a woman to be always in tears. I want so much to be a gay, cheerful companion for you. Well, it would be a pleasant change to see you smiling. I've tried so hard. But I keep thinking, thinking. Everything looks so hopeless. Well, why do you say that, Lisa? We're doing exactly what we planned to do. Your divorce. Getting the baby legally turned over to Kit. Now, when we can... The baby. Oh, Lisa. <laughs> what on earth is the matter with you? It's the baby I keep thinking about. I never should have done it. I never should have let Kit take the baby. But, Lisa, we've been all through that. You knew what you were doing. Maybe I thought I did. But I was wrong. I shouldn't have given the baby up, no matter what the reasons were. Well, it's done now, Lisa. It's too late. You'll have to pull yourself together. Forget all about it. Oh, but I can't forget. I'll never be able to. The baby is mine. I want him back, Paul. What? That's the way I feel, Paul. I, I can't help it. I want him back. <laughs> Paul Cromwell stared at the sobbing girl's bent head in horror. For Lisa's last words had come with the shock of something he dreaded, and yet had hoped against hope could be forestalled. If Lisa really meant what she'd said, if she attempted to reclaim her baby son, all Paul's plans with Kit Mead would be ruined. 